Hi everybody, this is Dr. A for the fifth video in our lab safety series. We're going to look at infection control. So uh, biohazards, as a reminder, denotes infectious material or agents that are present um, and that present sorry, a risk or even a potential risk to the health of humans or animals in the lab. Risk is defined as a probability that a health effect will occur after an individual has been exposed to a specified amount of a hazard or biohazard. Um, translated as if you get exposed to that biohazard, you would get sick or have some kind of effect. Um, and so um, related to that, we have biosafety levels one, two, three, and four. One is a level of a student lab. Two is what most hospitals and clinics are at, operating at, so to deal with pathogens, uh, but not esoteric things. Uh, bio level, bio safety level three is TB and certain viruses that can be spread by inhalation. And then bio safety level four is uh, labs like the CDC. Um, and so it's important to do risk assessment for biosafety and then uh, you know, enforce the proper containment uh, procedures for the level of work that's being done. Some general safety precautions. So hand hygiene, single most important means of preventing the spread of infection and antibiotic resistant microorganisms. People don't wash their hands enough. You have to wash your hands a lot if you work in healthcare. So hand hygiene does include washing the hands with soap and water or rubbing the hands with an alcohol-based hand agent. However, you've got to know that your hands are not considered clean until that alcohol-based uh, agent is completely dry on your hands. Okay. So when should you practice hand hygiene? Before and after you interact with each patient, uh, before and after removing gloves, so before putting them on after removing them, uh, before performing any kind of procedure on a patient. Uh, after removing any kind of um, personal protective equipment, after touching anything that's contaminated, uh, before going on break and after returning from break, and before leaving the lab at the end of your shift. So you're going to be washing your hands a lot if you work in healthcare. So you want to always wear the appropriate PPE when handling specimens. Um, this could include uh, fluid resistant gowns, aprons, masks, respirators, face shields, goggles, shoe covers, gloves. The type of PPE that you need will depend on the task or procedure that's being performed. As a general rule, avoid touching face, nose, or mouth uh, in your work area and in general, and don't rub your eyes. Also, don't put anything in your mouth in the work area, like a piece of bubble gum or something. Um, never store food or beverage in the lab refrigerator that has reagents and specimens, and those should be labeled with biohazard symbol. And don't let anything hang loose that might be, get contaminated or caught in equipment. So you want to protect your feet from spill slips and falling objects also. So avoiding transmission. So mm, the most frequent routes of exposure and accidental inoculation in the lab are going to be inhalation, so breathe in and per continuous inoculation, that's needle stick, uh, so anything that uh, pokes th through the skin, contact between mucous membranes and the contaminated material, so that's usually either splash or touch, so if you have contaminated hands and you touch your, your face, your nose, your mouth, whatever, that would be that type of contact. Um, but don't underestimate things splashing in your face. Um, ingestion, so again, especially something that's handled with dirty hands and then it's ingested. Uh, human bite, um, unfortunately you can get bit. Um, it's usually mostly by um, people that um, aren't all there, basically, they, their mental uh, status has been altered, uh, whether it's through dementia or, you know, uh, substances. And then uh, last co contact with a contaminated equipment. So, uh, yeah, touching something that is dirty without having proper equipment, uh, like personal protective equipment on. So uh, an occupational exposure to a bloodborne pathogen is either a percutaneous injury, so a needle stick or cut with a sharp object, 
or contact better mucous membranes or non-intact skin, so broken skin that has a wound or something, with either blood, tissues, blood-stained body fluids, body fluids to which standard precautions apply, or concentrated virus. Okay, that is what exposure to bloodborne pathogen is. So um, you want to try to avoid uh, transmission of these pathogens. So um, bloodborne viruses do survive much longer outside of the body that we once believed. Um, and this is talking about surviving in, you know, some dried feces, in some dried blood, blood or any, anything really. Um, the likelihood of infection after exposure to blood infected with hepatitis B virus or HIV virus depends on a variety of factors. So it depends on the concentration of the hepatitis B or the HIV virus in, in the sample, in the blood, in the feces, whatever. Um, if the viral concentration is higher, uh, then it's more likely that it's going to be transmitted. And as a rule, the viral concentration in blood is usually higher for hepatitis B than for HIV. So you are more likely to get hepatitis B than your HIV through blood uh, exposure. Uh, also, the duration of the contact, which is again why it's imperative that you, if you have any of this happen, anything splash, needle stick, whatever, that you wash the affected area uh, thoroughly so that you try to rinse and limit the contact um, of that infected uh, body fluid or blood with your mucous membrane or skin, etc. So if you have a skin, a skin lesion or abrasion on the hands or exposed skin of the healthcare worker, so that's a portal of entry for that virus or um, bacteria, and um, the immune status of the healthcare worker for HBV, so have you been vaccinated? So anybody that works in healthcare should be vaccinated for hepatitis B virus. Um, it is worth noting that most exposures do not result in infection. So that is uh, at least something that's good. So infectious agents can spread by five means. The first is contact. This can be direct and indirect. So it is the most frequent and important transmission route for healthcare associated infections. So direct contact involves a transfer of organism from an infected person directly to a susceptible host by physical contact. Often that infected person is maybe a carrier or silent carrier that they, they don't know that they have it and they have direct physical contact with somebody and they transmit the infection there. Indirect contact can involve contact between a susceptible host and a fomite. So this would be through uh, an inanimate object, uh, a doorknob, an elevator button, the button on a soda machine or something like that, and it's been touched by somebody that had an uh, infection and they didn't have clean hands, and, uh, and then the person comes behind them and touches the same object can pick up the infection. Uh, droplet uh, is the next means. So droplets are particles that are generated from the source by coughing, sneezing, or talking. And um, the droplets can also occur from liquid splashes or aerosols that are formed by uncapping a blood collection tube. So on that note, whenever you uncap a blood collection tube, you need to uncap it away from you, not towards you. Because if you, if you uncap it towards you and it aer aerosolizes, it can go straight into your nose, mucous membrane, face, uh, eyes, if you don't have glasses. And droplet transmission is usually only for a brief time and within a short distance, so about three feet from the source. So you're more concerned about, uh, you know, being in close proximity and talking to them or them coughing or sneezing when you're when they're near you. Uh, and usually you would wear a mask to protect that. So that was the part of the social distancing six feet, et cetera, was to try to prevent some of the droplet types of transmission of the virus. So uh, the next three are going to be airborne, a common vehicle and vector. So airborne transmission is droplet, but with the droplet nuclei being smaller than five microns, um, or dust particles that are generated by sneezing, coughing, singing, or talking, but then these guys kind of just hang out in the air. So there, it's a much finer aerosol and uh, it, it hangs out in the air and it, it's, it's, so it's beyond uh, 
you know, the three feet, six feet or whatever, it, it can just hang out there. And if somebody then walks past, they can breathe in the end without knowing. So um, they can be transported long distances and cause disease when inhaled. Um, airborne transmission is one of the concerns with TB. And then a uh, common vehicle is, again, a common source that can cause multiple cases of the disease. This could be food that's contaminated, water that's contaminated, medications that are contaminated, devices, uh, and equipment. So uh, devices that you may not always think about will be like a stethoscope that is used rep repeatedly um, between uh, one patient and another. If it's not decontaminated between patients, it could, you know, could spread. Same thing with equipment. Uh, and then the last one is vector. So vector are organisms that carry infectious agents but are not harmed by them. So ticks, uh, flies, uh, anything. So they, they move the infection from point A to point B. Okay, that would be uh, vector transmission. So, all right, so this wraps up this first part of infection control. The next video is going to have your safe work practices to prevent uh, you getting sick and to help with infection control. So. Stay tuned.